Good morning and welcome to the latest Asian Impact Webinar of the Asian Development Bank. Today's topic is tackling poverty and inequality during COVID-19. Last year marked the start of the decade of action and we find ourselves in a critical period where we see the need to advance our efforts to address development challenges confronting us, particularly in the areas of poverty and inequality. Since the pandemic started, we saw the socioeconomically vulnerable people being greatly affected. And indeed, there is an urgent need to address this concern. To kick things off, Mr. Joseph Albert Nino Bulan, Associate Statistics Analyst from ADB's Statistics and Data Innovation Unit, will share the key findings from the 2021 Key Indicators for Asia and the Pacific, ADB's statistical flagship publication presenting data on a wide range of development themes. Over to you, Seth. Thanks, Art. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'll just put up the slides. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. I am very pleased to share with you the empirical insights on where we stand with respect to a number of development targets before and when the COVID-19 pandemic struck. We are at a critical juncture as the COVID-19 pandemic has created unprecedented challenges for many economies attempting to achieve development targets, including the SDGs. With 10 years to go before the final SDG assessment, many economies in Asia and the Pacific are still trailing behind several SDG, critical SDG targets. Take SDG 1. Poverty reduction is an area where our region had done well in the past. Um, and this chart shows how the region had been contributing less to global extreme poverty, which is measured by the $1.9 a day threshold. Moving to a broader consumption distribution, here we see remar remarkable reduction in 3.2 poverty as well. As poverty declined, the size of the middle class actually increased. This is particularly noteworthy uh, among those who consume between five, $5.5 to $15 a day, with latest estimates showing that more than one in every three persons from developing Asia in this category, an increase of more than sevenfold can be noted over the past few decades. However, Containment measures curb the spread of COVID-19, such as lockdowns and restrictions in mobility. Uh, it had some adverse socioeconomic impacts. To learn about these impacts, colleagues from the ADB I Institute or Asian Development Bank Institute administered surveys between May to July of 2020 on approximately 1,000 households from each of the eight ASEAN countries covered. The respondents were asked about changes in monthly expenditure. Uh, and as you can see, the rightmost bar suggests that the poorer households were more likely to report faster decline. The yellow bars represent uh, the proportion of responding the, the, the proportion of respondents noting higher expenditure by either one to 25 percent which are depict, depicted by lighter shaded bars all the way to those reporting increase of more than 50 percent which are represented by the darker shaded bars analogously uh, the green bars represent those reporting expenditure uh, those reporting expenditure declines. The pattern um, predicted in this chart uh, shows that the poorer households were more likely to experience reduced consumption due to the disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite the surveys like this, um, it is challenging to give a definite estimate of poverty since the detailed data on household income and expenditures that are usually uh, used to estimate monetary poverty tend to be re released uh, with long lags. Hence, uh, most of the poverty estimates that aim to capture the pandemic's impacts are based on interpolations using GDP growth and some assumptions on inequality. 
So our team in ADB made assumptions using group distribution data on households income or consumption expenditures per capita and the latest GDP growth rates. One assumption uh, that we made was that all households within the country experienced the same percent decline in the per capita consumption expenditure. We refer to it as the neutral distribution assumption. And there are actually two sets of estimates that are currently presented here. The first one correspond to without the COVID-19 scenario, wherein we use growth forecast for 2020 using data from Asian Development Outlook 2019, which were the expected growth before the pandemic struck. While uh, the other one is the COVID-19 scenario, which is based on the latest GDP growth rates for 2020. The results show increase in extreme poverty rate by 2 percentage points in 2020 compared to a scenario without COVID-19. Uh, this increase is uh, in $1.9 a day poverty rate translate to roughly 75 to 80 million uh, more extreme poor, extremely poor people. We also see a 2.4 percentage point increase in the proportion of people living more than $1.9 a day, but less than $3.2. Relating this to the results of the ADBI survey, where we saw that lower income households were more likely to experience pronounced decline in their expenditure, it signals increasing inequality. So we also tried to relax the neutral distribution assumption by uh, projecting the distribution from the ADB, ADBI survey onto the whole of developing Asia. Our estimates show that um, consumption shares of the bottom 40% will decrease by approximately 0.5 to 0.7 percentage point, which is higher than, base, than the baseline estimate anchored on the neutral distribution assumption. This guided us uh, in identifying a range of uh, at which consumption shares of the bottom 40% in each country could change uh, as a result of the pandemic. In particular, in particular, first, we assume that the consumption share of the bottom 40% in each country reduces by 0.5 to 1 percentage point. And to be more to be comprehensive, uh, we also explored lower inequality scenarios wherein the consumption share of the bottom 40% increases. Um, the table shows that uh, what income distribution in the region could look like could look like under uh, varying inequality scenarios. If COVID-19 pandemic had been more devastating for lower income households, perhaps it's due to substantial uh, job loss and limited access to se social safety nets. And thus, uh, it contributes to the lower consumption shares of the bottom 40%. And extreme poverty could be much higher than what we initially anticipated under the neutral distribution assumption. But again, uh, I have to emphasize that these are preliminary estimates and further studies with more detailed data are needed to be able to better understand the scope, on this, or scope and scale of the pandemic's impact on poverty and inequality. Okay, now turning to uh, SDG2. Like the poverty trend, there had been substantial gains in reducing hunger and food insecurity over the past few decades. But recent trends show that progress has slowed or in some insta instances, it actually reversed. So this chart shows undernourishment trends in the region. As you can see, East Asia's performance has contributed significantly to reducing uh, the region's prevalence of undernourishment. Meanwhile, other subregions such as the South Asia and Central West Asia have witnessed a slower pace of reduction. The pandemic threatens to uh, further impede the region's progress in SDG2 targets, especially in the prevalence of undernourishment. This figure uh, shows the different consumption items for which spending had to be reduced to cope up with financial difficulty. More than one third had to reduce intake or number of meals, uh, which could have affected undernourishment trends, especially that in some of these countries, 
prevalence of food insecurity and undernourishment were already considerable um, even before COVID-19 pandemic struck. On SDG3 uh, about health, although the region uh, is performing well to the world average with respect to the SDG indicator on international uh, health regulations, there is a considerable variation within the region. A number of low and lower middle income countries perform below the regional average. And these variations uh, actually contributed to performance when the pandemic struck. Uh, in this chart, uh, we plotted the coverage of essential health services index against COVID-19 performance, against COVID performance, um, compiled by an uh, Australian think tank. As we can see, economies scoring higher in coverage of essential health services tend to perform better. Now, moving on to SDG4. With respect to the basic uh, education completion rates, economies um, in the region have sustained 90% completion rates for, for primary uh, school and above uh, 80% for um, lower secondary school over the past decade. However, completion rates uh, for upper secondary levels remain below 60% and, particip and participation in organized learning has barely improved in recent years for a number of our regional members. Moreover, there are notable disparities in these uh, educational uh, education outcomes. If we disaggregate uh, the completion rates by wealth quintiles, we see that the students uh, from more affluent background continue to have significantly higher completion rates. Uh, on the other hand, the gap between the lower wealth quintiles and the rest of the population is not narrowing, particularly with respect to upper secondary education completion rates. Um, such disparities uh, are further compounded by disruption caused by the pandemic. The ADBI survey data shows um, that school age population among poorer households had significantly less access to distance learning since um, the schools that they are enrolled that they are enrolled uh, did not offer any such programs. On the other hand, where schools did offer such programs, differences in participation by children in distance learning were less evident across socioeconomic groups. It is also uh, important to note that a considerable number of education systems and students in the region have limited access to remote-based learning resources um, because of a lack of internet connectivity at home particularly in lower income countries, as you can see in this chart. In terms of employment, uh, employment is another indicator that we need to look into. From 2019 to 2020, unemployment uh, increased in 21 out of 23 economies with available data. Of these 16 uh, economies saw their unemployment rates increase by at least 10% while one-third saw increases of 20% or more. But overall, the region lost um, approximately 8% of work hours in 2020. There are also indications that poorer, house, poorer people were more adversely affected. And again, based on the ADBI survey, for instance, the proportion of households with at least one member losing a job or having their um, working hours reduced was significantly higher among poorer households. This emphasizes the importance of enhancing the delivery of social protection programs, particularly for those uh, in the informal economy who do not have adequate uh, financial buffers or access to, stand, to standard employment entitlements. Um, furthermore, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on work and employment is believed to be disproportionately borne by women with a risk of amplify, um, amplifying um, gender uh, inequalities in the labor market. On the average, uh, labor in uh, reporting Labor, from, labor force participation rates among men in reporting economies declined by 0.8% compared to women's decline of 1.3%.
uh, working uh, women across Asia and the Pacific are also uh, underrepresented in the jobs that are suitable for remote work, such as professional, technical, and scientific work, and nearly two-thirds remain in vulnerable uh, and informal employment. The ILO has estimated that about 40% of all women work in sectors severely affected by the pandemic. The IF findings that I just presented underscore how the challenges of meeting development targets, which needed urgent attention even before the global uh, health crisis began, it actually uh, has intensified. And moving forward, we need to strengthen our capacity to harness data. In a dynamic um, environment where scenarios change rapidly, appro appropriate data is crucial to develop suitable responses. However, as the pandemic disrupted many activities and services, the task of compiling timely data-tested statistical capacities. Nevertheless, NSOs or National Statistical Offices persevered and the results of our survey showed that they undertook new initiatives to redesign data collection, compilation, and dissemination activities to be able to ensure the continuity of critical data series. But of course, challenges uh, still remain. At ADB, we continuously work with national statistical systems to help strengthen their capacity in providing high quality, timely, and granular data that can be uh, used to, to facilitate um, evidence-based policy making. Um, we also provide a wide array of data-intensive knowledge products such as the KI, or the Key Indicators for the Asia and the Pacific Report, which continues to serve as a vital source of data and statistics for our development practitioners. We hope that our knowledge products and services help bring focus, bring into focus a range of uh, important development issues and provide evidence for new thinking on pandemic recovery and, of course, serving as a valuable resource for data on development indicators. Um, with that, uh, we would like to thank everyone for your attention and support, continued support for the KI publication. Over to you, Art. Thanks a lot, Seth, for walking us through a wide range of compelling data and statistics showing the scope of socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 um, pandemic. So and at this point, I'm very pleased to introduce four experts who are joining us um, this morning to share their uh, perspectives on how the pandemic has magnified longstanding social and economic inequities experienced by millions living below or near poverty line, and hopefully discuss how governments and more generally the development community are intensifying efforts to minimize the risk of people who are already struggling to make ends meet to tip over into a life of further hardship and poverty. Hopefully that can be prevented. Uh, I also look forward to hear what the development community is doing to ensure that no one will be left behind as we aim to rebuild our economies better and more resilient. So first, may I welcome uh, Ms. Bogan Bezgalan, who is the Deputy Chairperson of Mongolia's National Development Agency. She is in charge of foreign direct investment and multilateral cooperation at NDA, the regulatory agency of the government of Mongolia. She brings with her very rich experience in the field of development. And um, I'm sure that all of us here are looking forward to hear her reflections about the theme of today's discussion. So very pleased to have you, Ms. Bogan. Our next panelist is um, Dr. Sophanada Luhachai, who is the head of social development monitoring and evaluation section of Thailand's National Economic and Social Development Council, where Pearl has been involved in, in the compilation of um, National Multidimensional Poverty Index. So um, I'm also eager to hear um, Dr. Pearl's perspectives on how the pandemic has affected the different facets of, of poverty, particularly in Thailand. 
Our next two panelists are from the international development community. We are joined by Ms. Um, Jessamine Encarnacion. She serves as inter-regional advisor on statistics and lead of the data and statistics work on UN Women's Global Gender uh, Data Program called Women Count. Jessa is managing a UN Women's Initiative in supporting dozens of countries in conducting rapid uh, gender assessments to measure the social economics of COVID-19. So I'm pretty sure she, she will be sharing her insights on the gender dimensions of, of the pandemic. And then also joining the panel is um, Mikil van der Avera, who is our senior social development specialist here at ADB. He supports ADB's goals to tackle remaining poverty and reducing um, inequality through uh, the enhancement of social protection for all. Um, Mikil's expertise um, is, is on social protection that includes pension, social insurance, labor market interventions, and, and targeted social interventions. He's also the team leader for um, technical assistance programs on social protection and quality jobs. So uh, looking forward to hear his uh, insights on, on the role of social safety nets uh, play in, in tackling socioeconomic challenges brought by the pandemic and how we are, are moving forward in this regard. All right, so panelists, I'd like to start our discussion by re echoing what, what Seth shared earlier. So from his presentation, uh, he noted about the, the ADB staff simulation showing roughly 75 to 80 million more people um, were, were pushed into extreme poverty in developing Asia uh, in comparison to what would have happened if there was no COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So he explained earlier this estimate could be higher if, if we count for the pandemic's impact on inequality. So in other words, data really show that the pandemic has undermined years of socioeconomic progress, not, not only within Asia and the Pacific, but also in other parts um, of, the, of the world. So for a number of countries, this is probably the, the worst recession in several decades. And that is probably weighing most heavily on poor people and other vulnerable segments of societies. But at the same time, however, there could be very, there might be variations in experiences of countries and economies. So at this point, if I may address the, the first question to NDA uh, Deputy Chairperson Bulgan and Dr. Pearl from NESDC, as I'm sure that our audience are, are quite keen to know more about country specific experiences. So how impactful is the pandemic on poverty and inequality in Mongolia and Thailand? If Mongolia could go first and, and then Thailand, please. Uh, but before you respond, I encourage the audience to um, type your questions on the chat box so, so we could re reflect on those questions as we go along. Over to you, um, Ms. Bulgan. Thank you, Art. Uh, good day, good morning to everyone. And uh, I would like to start with a quote saying while I read it somewhere recently um, that while um, people were fighting the virus at the front line, the healthcare uh, specialists were on the front line fighting, the statisticians also were fighting hard to gather data in, um, during stringent times um, so that we can develop, policymakers can develop evidence-based policy. So I salute all the statisticians who are organizing today's event and who are speaking today. So uh, uh, I will speak uh, probably the known patterns, probably the pandemic hit us in similar ways, despite our differences, different contexts. But I will also try to focus on probably some unique experiences from Mongolia. Um, I will try in that way. So. Uh, we have had probably 10 different lockdown measures in the past uh, two years. So first 10 months in Mongolia was relatively safe while the world was already dealing with the virus. Somehow we have managed to contain the virus uh, prevented from entering the country for successful 10 months. 
Then we had very, very difficult uh, uh, year following that. In that, within that one year, uh, we had, as I just said, 10 different lockdown measures, and we had to declare state emer emergency for several times. And um, obviously, everybody struggled. Everybody went through hard times. But today, I think uh, probably all the, as all the other participants do, we will focus on the vulnerable groups. In my case, it's the youth and the women. Um, in terms of um, women, uh, obviously, they suffered in terms of health and well-being they suffered the most economically they were hit the hardest and um, in, in a nutshell the inequality was further uh, widened. Mongolia's economy was already quite volatile because we are extractive industry and we are heavily dependent on uh, exporting commodities so with the fluctuation of prices and of course um, also challenging uh, because of challenging um, fiscal discipline, we already had um, 29 to 30% of poverty prior to the pandemic. And the worry is that this will be exacerbated further and of course disproportionately. So for the women, I have just a couple of data to polish my argument further. Of course, the health workers, right? Uh, the global is 70% of the health workers are women. In, in Mongolia's case, it's uh, 82%. So obviously they were hit the hardest. Uh, one of the um, big challenges for Mongolia was also the uh, maternal mortality was increased by 28%. Mongolia was actually one of the very few countries who had successfully uh, eliminated maternal mortality during the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals. Unfortunately, the COVID wiped that away from us. Um, the domestic violence obviously increased a lot. We have uh, registered calls increase of 30% to police because of domestic violence. And economically also, obviously, women uh, during the lockdowns, women are at home. So I think this is a global indicated that women tend to have more responsibilities at home. So that obviously was not avoided in Mongolia, but the policies uh, we took, unfortunately, could not to take that into consideration as much as we had hoped. Um, another signal was on women-owned SMEs. Uh, there are some registered 80,000 women SMEs in Mongolia, but then there's also a huge portion of um, unregistered small businesses in Mongolia. So when the stimulus package uh, from the government was offered, it did not take consideration uh, of the unregistered businesses because basically we did not have the data to track them down. So access to capital was jeopardized. And obviously they were suffering loss of business networks, access to uh, mentoring services during this time, obviously. And when the government was compensating, uh, the policies could not reflect this uh, losses much. Also, the employers could not give prefer, preferred leaves or benefits to the employees, the female employees, as much as we had hoped. Um, all this policy making also probably could be triggered by the fact that there is inequality in the decision making in women we, even the parliamentarian level we are below regional average at 18 percent but during the times state emergency commission were basically the, was the main organization chief organization who was or orchestrating all the emergency decisions and uh, we were curious enough to dig into the composition of the state emergency commission and only 11% of them were women. Probably that's why there was also this proportion in decision making. Uh, female headed households also were affected the most. Uh, some of the surveys indicated that 30% of the female headed households witnessed reduction in income during these times. What's also unique about Mongolia is the fact that we are also partially nomadic country. Although half of the population lives in Ulaanbaatar, half of uh, us still live in the countryside, uh, roaming throughout the country. 
So female herders is another interesting uh, focus group that we have to pay attention to because they are living in the steppes, isolated from most of the basic services. Uh, usually they go to the nearest villages, some centers to receive their basic uh, medical treatments, for example. All of this access were denied <clears throat> due to the lockdown and you are a single household um, in the pure wilderness obviously you could imagine the tolls of this on the female herders um, inequality obviously was uh, widening uh, the education was also heavily disrupted the schools have been closed in mongolia for almost two years and Although the Ministry of Education were offering classes online, now you imagine half of the population also living in the countryside. So imagine the, um, imagine the <clears throat> digital divide, access to internet uh, to receive this education. So currently there is not much available data on um, how is it, this is going to impact the girls' education, the youth education in future, but I'm sure in due times, there will be a huge toll on this. Youth unemployment is already a big problem in Mongolia. Uh, so those who graduate from the universities, access to jobs usually take longer for Mongolia. That's about 2.2 years. That's also longer than regional average. And we see this number also increasing after the tolls of the COVID. And uh, from the statistics office, I checked this morning that unemployed employment among the age group above 20 to 32 is, uh, has been increased by two to 33%. So basically this, this is what happened in Mongolia after the pandemic. And then uh, I'll speak further on government measures and what we need to take into consideration further. Thanks a lot, uh, Ms. Bulgan, for, for sharing those um, experiences of, of Mongolia. And what I gather from, from what you just mentioned, there are a lot of uncertainties that lie ahead, particularly for, for the most vulnerable segments of, of the uh, country. Um, so on, on that note, um, perhaps I would like to get Dr. Pearl's insight on, on what these uncertainties uh, mean for poverty and inequality. Uh, in, in the case of Thailand, is there a compelling reason for us to be to expect worsening poverty and inequality, or is there um, more reasons to, to be optimistic? Thank you, Art, and good morning, everyone. Um, in the case of Thailand, it's I think it's probably similar to to the case of Mongolia. For 20, 2020, we were quite successful in containing the virus for the first wave, but then toward the end of the year and coming into to, to this year and still ongoing, you know, the, the, um, we were hit much harder. So, so we, we just recently got the, the data for 2020. And so the data sort of the overall data didn't show much of an increase. You know, the, the number of the poor has increased by around half a million people um, in Thailand for the year 2020. And similarly, um, if you look at inequality, overall in inequality, um, you know, like uh, uh, Gini coefficient, it didn't show much increase. But if you look sort of deeper into the data and you could see that uh, the pandemic sort of in terms of, of poverty, the pandemic has, intensify the severity of poverty you know so the, the the poor has become extreme poor uh and 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 all that uh, as as well as in terms of inequality if we disaggregate population into deciles we can see that the upper deciles from decile three to ten uh can still on average they, they can still see saw their expenditure increase due to that adjustment of their lifestyle to the new normal. But if you look at this R1 and 2, they had actually had to reduce their expenditure um, in order to cope with the loss of their income and their uh, financial vulnerability. So um, 
with, with that and you know with the as I said, um, we were hit harder toward the end of 2020 and also still ongoing this year. Um, also, you know, coupled with you know, tighter fiscal constraints, you know, um, I, I, I think um, the poverty and inequality in Thailand um, might, uh, coming into this year and next year, might not be too op optimistic. You know, in fact, um, recently, the Bank of Thailand has has even predicted that uh, uh, the, the the recovery will be more toward a K shaped recovery. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Dr. Pearl, um, for for those reflections. And I, I'm conscious about some of the questions that started um, coming up um, through the chat box. One one of the questions is really more on the impact of the pandemic on a temporal uh, perspective, because if you unpack it, there are immediate impact and then there are medium and long-term uh, uh, concerns that could potentially uh, be very impactful for the most vulnerable segments. So I'm wondering if Jessa could probably, Jessa and Mikkel could probably uh, share some of their reflections about what are the medium and, and long-term socioeconomic mobility prospects of some of the vulnerable segments of society. So earlier, Ms. Bogan uh, spoke about the, the conditions of women uh, in Mongolia. Perhaps, Jessa, you could share uh, from a much, much wider perspective. Um, Jessa? Yeah, thank you, Art, and greetings every, to everyone. So definitely one key point that I would like to say here. COVID-19 may be gender blind, but it is definitely not gender neutral. So UN Women's analysis on the impacts of the pandemic revealed that it is exacerbating gender inequalities. And if I may add, gender inequalities in itself is already a pre-existing condition that we are going through even uh, without the pandemic. So it, the pandemic actually deepens gender-based discrimination and vulnerability. And these results are actually coming from rapid gender assessment surveys that we have supported in more than 70 countries, or I would refer to today as as RGAs. Uh, we look at the gendered impacts, yes. I think, uh, as you, has you, you have mentioned, Art, this has been uh, covered in Joseph's presentation in um, Mongolia's uh, intervention. But also, I mean, beyond disaggregation by sex or the gendered impacts of pan the pandemic, in the principle of leaving no one behind and ergo be leaving no woman or girl behind, it is also important to stress that just looking at inequalities by sex is not enough. We need to understand that even among women, specific subgroups are impacted differently during the pandemic. So just I'll just look at uh, make three uh, points in terms of um, uh, impacts to poverty through economic um, uh, economic effects, and then secondly, time poverty through unpaid care and domestic work, and thirdly, uh, poverty in terms of uh, limited access to relief measures. So. Looking at, we were able to do rapid gender assessments in 11 countries in Asia and the Pacific. So, uh, this only, ref, uh, I mean, our findings for the region only reflects these countries. So, obviously, as mentioned by colleagues, the economic gap between women and men have further widened. But looking at specific subgroups of women, for example, across different age groups, if you look at um, loss of jobs in uh, in the region, it is more. Uh, happening around uh, younger women aged between 18 and 24 years old compared to other uh, women age groups. But in terms of reduced paid work hours, it's those among women aged between 25 and 44 years who are more likely to experience this. And then also, if you also see, zoom into marital status and presence of children, we are seeing that partnered women with children were more likely to lose their jobs and also uh, more likely to reduce uh, paid work hours as compared to those who are single or those without uh, uh, children living with them. So that's for the first point. Now on the second point, as we see more women in the region losing jobs or reducing paid work hours, uh, women were still more likely to get the lion's share of unpaid care and domestic work. 
uh, impeding the shifting of gender roles in the home or uh, distributing uh, unpaid care in domestic work. And one important finding that we uh, would like to stress here is that while it has been hypothesized by some that the greater vulnerability to the COVID virus in older age reduces the provision of care by older individuals, actually the RGA data reveals uh, that, act that more than half of married older women, those aged uh, 60 or over, um, estimated at 57%, reported increasing uh, time spent in unpaid care and domestic work hours. So I think that that's one thought to, to give that, you know, traditionally we might look at older population or older women in gen uh, here in this, as recipients of care, but in fact, they're also givers of, uh, of care. And lastly, if we look at relief measures in the region in response to the pandemic, given its potential as an enabler and equalizer, given all these inequalities. Unfortunately, we see that government social protection schemes have fallen short for women. Women were significantly less likely than men to receive cash relief, 9% for women versus 19% for men. And women were also less likely to be covered by unemployment insurance. It's 6% for women versus 14% for, for men. And even in terms of NGO support, women were less likely than men to receive support, 6% for women versus 10% for, for men. So as a final note, the multiple challenges that women and girls face as a result of the pandemic require a comprehensive response aimed at addressing heightened levels of economic insecurity, increased demand for unpaid care and domestic work, among others. And if we are truly serious on addressing this gendered gaps, the approach should be, and I always say this, it should be, our mantra should be nothing about us without us. Thus, women's participation in leadership in pandemic response planning is critical. Over, uh, thank you and over to you, Art. Thanks a lot, um, Jessa. It's good that you mentioned um, the, the important role of this social protection, um, um, social safety net. So probably at this point, I want to, I want to bring in um, Mikhail because this is his um, um, domain of expertise. We, we know in developing countries, there's much to be desired in terms of social protection, and therefore people turn into coping strategies as stopgap measures um, to, to soften the severity of impacts of crisis. Mikhail, did you see any difference in terms of coping strategies employed by, by poor people? And like, how, how can we step up our game in terms of expanding provision of social safety nets? Yeah, uh, thank you, Art, and, and good morning, everyone. Yeah, the, the pandemic has really um, affected the poor uh, considerably harder than, um, you know, than the non-poor. So the, the equality of society has, has, has been uh, further tested. As, as uh, Joseph mentioned, there's about 75 to 80 million new poor, uh, well, uh, extreme uh, people in extreme poverty. And it is either poor who fell deeper into poverty or new poor that fell into poverty. And, and the new poor for us, what we saw is, is they're often um, working in informal sector, in, in urban settings, and have no um, uh, mechanisms, uh, uh, safety net mechanisms to, to fall back on. You know, on these this different vulnerable groups, um, no, I hear Jessa and, and no, women are definitely amongst uh, the ones that are affected the most. You know, they, uh, they work a lot in the informal sector, so you know, have, have been uh, hit from that end, but also provide a lot of unpaid uh, care work, and, and, you know, which limits their ability to, to earn uh, money uh, elsewhere. Youth has been hardly hit. Um, one, the school, the school closures, uh, the kids that uh, have to uh, study from home. Um, that is not a problem for my kids, but for kids of, of poorer families, you know, that again brings uh, a divide that uh, you know, will need to be restored uh, towards the future. Um, but also the young workers have been uh, hit very hard. You know, they, they work often in, in the hardest hit sectors, you know, like services, tourism, and so on. 
and and you know they have i mean they they have um, had uh, much more uh, i mean the rise in unemployment and underemployment is is much larger for the youth than for you know the rest of the labor force other vulnerable group is is the older workers that actually um, well uh, are unable to uh, go to work because they're really the most vulnerable uh, because of this covid uh, pandemic and, and at the same time, the family transfers have reduced as well. Other vulnerable groups include you know, the migrant workers who have been seriously hit as well. And, and of course, like disabled uh, people in, uh, with, with disabilities have, have also you know, uh, missed out on a, on a lot of opportunities. The coping mechanisms, I think, are traditionally the same, you know, that uh, uh, people um, People uh, return to their to their villages re to return to uh, rural areas, or start indebting the, themselves, which actually will have a, a lot of impact towards the future, towards the the, the recovery. Um, obviously, those who are able to work went back to work as as soon as they could, but uh, maybe that hasn't been a good thing for for the for uh, you know handling the pandemic uh, at the same time. Um, on, on the social safety net uh, part, that you know, it's it's always been uh, known that you know uh, Asia has, has you know has always spent a little on social protection and social safety nets, so uh, low benefits, low coverage. Um, actually, during the crisis, one must say that they stepped up. You know, the social protection coverage has, has increased, be it on a temporary basis, but uh, you know, very drastic. Um, but here we see that you know, the, the social safety nets have been effective for, you know, for the, the mechanisms that existed. You know, like uh, in, in case there are safety nets, like the four Ps in, in the Philippines of the, BR, the BISP in Pakistan, you know, these people have been, they're in a social registry, they, you know, they can be targeted and, and you know, benefits can get uh, easily to them. Um, people in the formal sector, uh, like most of us, they you know they get where well, they uh, can work remotely. But if they not can cannot work remotely, there's always you know the mechanism is in place like unemployment benefits and so on to to uh, uh, to help them. But what what is uh, the ones that really fell out? Uh, you know, are the ones that work in the informal sector and were not poor before uh, the pandemic, but have been impacted so much by you know the uh, the fact that they they could not uh, work and and you know that often also because they're working in in the sectors that have been hit the hardest. So I, I think going forward uh, for you know the recovery, you know given that you know a lot of these uh, poor and vulnerable vulnerable people are in in you know uh, indebted and and in a poor sit in in a in a difficult situation. I think a continuation of, of this uh, safety net uh, interventions are, are required, you know. Um, but uh, at the same time, with the opening up of, of you know, the, the, the economy, then you know, those who lost their jobs and are able to work will need to be supported by, you know, by uh, programs that help them to uh, get back into the labor market. Um, and, and mechanisms such as uh, you know, re training, retraining, uh, job facilitation um, are, are very important actually to, to make that you know, those who lost their job during the pandemic um, are, are back into uh, employment uh, early on. Thank you, Hart. Thanks a lot, Mikhail. Uh, you spoke about a number of the programs being implemented by different countries that could potentially be very um, useful for, for uh, the, the poorer segments of society. And I guess that re echoes to some of the questions that started uh, coming in about policy related response. Uh, what lessons are we drawing from how we reacted from the first few months of the pandemic and as it evolved? Um, and I guess that the question is really more on has our agility to reflect on those lessons on those data that we got over the past 18 months has that improved over over during this time that we have been um, calibrating our, our policy action so perhaps um, Jessa if, if you could 
um, start crystallize for us what have we learned in terms of policy response to, to address the expanding gender inequalities caused by pandemic? Uh, thank you, Art. Unfortunately, I don't have any better news to share. Uh, data revealed that across countries, the national COVID-19 policy responses remain largely gender blind and therefore put women at risk of being left behind. We say this because we collaborated with UNDP. So UN Women and UNDP uh, developed a gender policy tracker. We looked at 2,500 policies and measures. Uh, across 206 uh, countries and territories. And we look at three specific domains, violence against women and girls, women's economic security, and unpaid care work. And we assess the extent to which policy response has addressed women's needs and whether they are gender sensitive. Uh, looking specifically in uh, Asia and the Pacific, we have data for Eastern and Southeastern Asia and the Pacific for 28 countries. Out of these 28, uh, there's 22 who had gender sensitive measures put in place. But if we zoom in particularly on those measures that would have economic women's economic security, there's only six countries that would have those specific measures. And then if we look at specifically on um, measures addressing unpaid care, there's only four countries out of 28 that would uh, specifically address that uh, um, serious concern. And then, uh, of course, I mean, looking at this data from the policy side of things and also looking at data from uh, the RGAs or the rapid gender assessments, we found that women in countries that had policy measures specifically targeting women's economic security were 1.8 times as likely to report receiving government relief compared to women counterparts in countries that did not have such policies. And if I may add, in countries without measures of addre in, uh, in addressing women's unpaid care, women were also 1.8 times more likely to report negative impacts on their mental, their mental health, their emotional health, uh, overall well-being, compared to women in countries that have put in place such measures on addressing uh, care policies. So I think the bottom line to limit widening of the gender gap in different socioeconomic spheres and further mar marginalization of groups of women in the medium and long term, it is critical to not only collect data, but also use this data and transform this to national policy responses and recovery efforts that are gender responsive. So three points, more investments in gender data collection, need to prioritize uh, data disaggregation and collect individual level data. This is particularly important for poverty statistics that more often than not, it's always at the household level. And we know that inter-household distribution of resources does not happen equally among household members. So it's important that we have individual level data, particularly for poverty. And lastly, we must uh, strengthen uh, national statistical systems, and more broadly, gender data ecosystems. I see uh, uh, an intervention whether we're tapping on uh, big data sources, and this is the time when, you know, um, uh, a new normal or new innovative ways should be tapped. So hence, uh, a broader scope of engaging with other data sources and data users should be put in place. And this last point, uh, just underscoring that we have to increase the value of gender data only if we had inten intentional efforts to use this data. So we're, we have to increasingly shift our perspective to promote data use and not just on uh, data, uh, data collection. So we also have collect data on how we use the data. Over. Thanks a lot. A very, um, I think, uh, very insightful um, suggestions there, um, Jessa. And I'm, I see Dr. Pearl and Ms. Bolgan um, nodding. So please articulate your nod, uh, Dr. Pearl, per first. Well, thank you. I, I totally agree with um, Jessa in, in, in that, particularly the, the, the last point, you know, um, as well as the individual data. Um, it's, Thailand is also moving toward that in terms of, you know, trying to target poverty and trying to find the poor and then come out to set out like um, 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 solutions for them, you know, to, to ensure that. And also on the, not only collecting, but also have to advocate the use of the data. Um, yeah, so totally agree with that. As um, 
for for the case of Thailand, um, I think what we learned is 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 that um, um, the quick response really 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 um, have a positive impact on 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 everything. You know, uh, also in terms of you know the the rapid relief measures that we roll out um, in the early. Uh, 2020 for the case of Thailand, you know, um, that has sort of, you, you know, obviously the, the result for Thailand in, in 2020 was was pretty okay, it, partly because we didn't, we weren't hit hard, hard also as well as, you know, being fast on relief measures, which cover, you know, um, most of the measures sort of target the vulnerable and the informal sector, you know, so 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 by covering that, it, it was uh, we were able to sort of ensure that there, there weren't that the most um, affected um, population were taken care of. But but then there are also still you know gaps, you know, <laughs> you know of course in terms of um, for Thailand and 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 for overall um, picture in Thailand is this um, I think the 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 big gap that that um, that has become apparent is 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 the the data system, you know. So so um, be, because we don't have the uh, integrated uh, social protection data um, system, so every time the government um, roll out new schemes, um, we have to do the registrations and and so and and also do the you know like verification, make sure that. Um, People don't get, um, you know, too, too, um, too many transfers or or this, um, I, so those kind of things, you know. So 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 basically, that that was quite an overwhelming work, and and so um, that sort of come up to the um, now that we are trying to sort of come out with the the, the concrete solution that the Thai government also. Um, trying to come up with this, um, what we call the e-social welfare platform, which would sort of trying to integrate the social welfare um, databases together. And hopefully, um, maybe ultimately in five years or so, we were able to sort of integrate them together so that all citizens um, would receive um, social protection that are prop uh, appropriate for them and automatically without having to register it um, one um, one program at a time. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Pearl. Indeed, this has been a very insightful discussion, but I'm afraid that we're uh, drawing closer to the 60 minute mark. So perhaps in just like quick points in, in hopefully in 30 seconds or less, uh, Ms. Wilgan, any final thoughts you would like to share? Thank you. I have been assessing the stimulus package uh, actions that have been taken by the government. And one significant difference that we have to address is that unless there is a targeted program for the marginalized groups, the main programs are not as inclusive to, to include the women and the marginalized groups. So uh, we need to mainstream the inclusion of them, even in the bigger programs like the mortgage loans, the payments from the employees to subsidize the leaves. So uh, it's not to support the marginalized group does not mean you just end up with this targeted programs, right? It's all about mainstreaming and cannot agree with uh, furthermore with uh, Jess and um, Pearl on gender uh, disaggregated data is basically the lesson we learned from the pandemic. Thank you. Great point. Thanks a lot, uh, Ms. Bulgan. Uh, Mikhail, any final thoughts? Yes, Art. Um, you know, I, I think the, the COVID has been um, a terrible thing, but it's it's also a wake up call for you know for for um, you know countries in the region to step up you know social protection and the role of social protection. I'm happy to hear Pearl saying that you know we should have this integrated social protection system that basically provides the, the, the support to the people what they need, right? And and uh, it's not the first time I hear this. I mean, I heard this from other countries in the region as well. 
So I think going forward, you know, there's there's um, a couple of things that you know uh, for for social protection, you know, one is you know it, it needs to be further expanded and and social policies need to be further developed. The the capacity needs to be developed and there's a strong role for registration for for um, technology, you know, and and the role of technology actually binds in well with what Pearl was saying that you know if if different databases can interconnect and and whatsoever. And, and the last, the last one is really the challenge is that I mean there will be more need for for I support for more uh, social protection, but that's also requiring more funding, and that is just a, a little bit of a sore point for the moment, you know, because countries have spent already a lot on on, on social protection during this crisis. Going forward, you know, that the, the the challenge will be how they can continue doing that by hopefully con uh, collecting more taxes and with a, a solid uh, social protection system, illustrating that taxes really uh, bear their, uh, uh, reap their, uh, what, what is it, bring their fruits and that, uh, that, uh, that the money is, is spent for a good cause. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mikhail. Um, I, I think that provides us a number of things to, to reflect on so that uh, moving forward, this can be really um, the, seeds for a uh, more sustainable recovery, particularly uh, that would be particularly beneficial for the poorest segments of society. And with that, um, thank you very much to our um, panelists for a very fantastic discussion. Uh, my apologies, we exceeded um, two minutes, um, but indeed this is a very productive discussion. Um, I also would like to thank our audience for your very active participation through the questions you raised. Um, for now, we, we hope to see everyone again on the 27th of October um, at 3 to 4 p.m. Manila time for our next webinar on wellness for our a Healthy Asia book launch. So in, in the meantime, um, thanks again. Have a pleasant day ahead and keep safe, everyone. Thank you.